Welcome to Eye on Academia, a monthly podcast presented by the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. The Martin Center is dedicated to the reporting and analysis of higher education events, policies, and trends. I'm Jay Shallon, the host for today, and a senior fellow with the Martin Center. Higher education's influence on the intellectual life of the nation is hard to overestimate. It is where most new ideas are conceived, incubated, and spread to the general population. If you don't like the direction the nation is moving in any aspect, political, cultural, educational, and so on, chances are you have academia to thank, at least in part. Therefore, our colleges and universities need eyes on them so they cannot operate in secrecy and use their influence to undesirable ends. We hope this program serves just that purpose. For today, members of our team of higher education analysts have each picked a recent story or event to discuss. Without further ado, let's meet them. First up will be Jenna Robinson, who is the president of the Martin Center. She'll be followed by Shannon Watkins, who has been uh, with the Martin Center for six years and is a full-time writer and researcher. And finally, we'll have Graham Hillard, uh, who is the managing editor. Okay, so uh, Jenna, you're first up. Right, so for once, we've got some really good news in higher education, and that good news is coming out of North Carolina, so we're really excited. Um, There are two things going on right now. The UNC Board of Governors, which is the the entity that oversees the UNC system and its 16 institutions, is in the middle of adopting a resolution prohibiting compelled speech. Um, The governance committee of the Board of Governors voted last month to adopt the resolution, which basically says that faculty hiring committees and admissions offices will not compel students or potential faculty or potential hires uh, to make statements on statements of belief, about political affiliation, about controversial topics, about political topics. And I think this is a this is a real win for freedom of conscience on campus. It means that universities won't be able to make people swear not to be a communist. And it also means that universities won't be able to demand DEI statements uh, for applicants or for potential hires. Um, And I think it's really relevant right now because universities have been doing just that. An article came out today, in fact, uh, that NC State has on their application for admissions um, a required statement about diversity, equity, and inclusion for all potential undergraduate students. Um, And clearly, statements like this or the demand that students submit statements like this are political litmus tests. And so this new compelled, this anti-compelled speech resolution will will end the use of political litmus tests in the UNC system. So I think that's a, a really positive development. Uh, the Board of Governors will vote on that in their full board meeting on February 23rd. So looking forward to, to seeing that happen. Um, the other thing in North Carolina that has, is, is very exciting is that the UNC Chapel Hill Board of Trustees voted recently to accelerate the development of a school of civic life and leadership. And uh, that is something that had already been in the works by the administration. And the Chapel Hill trustees basically saw that it was potentially a very good thing, a very positive development for the school and has voted to to accelerate that development. Um, The school will be devoted to both you know, the ideals of civic life and leadership, but also the skills that students need and that are severely lacking. Uh, They're going to focus on oral communication, on the ability to listen, on intellectual humility, um, on the on the ability to talk to people and reason with people with whom you don't agree, Uh, the ability to to use evidence in arguments. Um, So kind of the, the traditional rhetoric that got dropped from from curricula uh, will be brought back as an important skill that students will learn while they're also learning um, you know the the traditions and the institutions for a plural pluralistic uh, democratic republic like the one that we live in that relies on 
everyone to have this kind of common civic knowledge and civic life, uh, you know, working together uh, to to come up with solutions for common problems. So I'm really excited about both of those both of those developments here in North Carolina. Jenna, I have to ask, you're very excited, uh, but what what has the response been from the campus community in general and the U UNC system? Um, right. So I think the loudest response to the School of Civic Life and Leadership came from the Faculty Executive Council, which didn't like it because they interpreted, interpreted it as the, the trustees doing something without permission. And of course, according to the faculty executive council, the trustees need permission to sneeze. So, so they didn't like it. They don't like um, being told that there's something that the university isn't doing well, um, which is which was kind of the underlying um, reasoning for having this school is that the school hasn't been teaching intellectual humility. It hasn't been teaching students to talk ac across differences. These are these are things that are uh, that are that students want that the school has been failing to deliver. The faculty did not like hearing that. They they all said, "Well, we've been doing this in our classes forever." Well, the students have said loud and clear that you know they're still self censoring. There are problems on campus. Clearly, you haven't. Um, so the faculty didn't like that. And then they also didn't like the the trustee initiative of of pushing forward this proposal before it had gone through all the various hoop jumping of of faculty governance. And so for those two reasons, the faculty council was very, very vocally opposed to the new school, um, really hostile and, and and basically told the administrators and the trustees, you know, we don't trust you and we don't want this. So that that wasn't a great reaction, but I think it was from a, you know, a minority viewpoint on campus. Most faculty are not involved in the faculty executive council. This this represents a small, very activist voice on campus, and the reaction, you know, off campus by North Carolina citizens and you know citizens around the country has been really really positive, and so. I think that's probably a better gauge of what, you know, an average North Carolinian thinks about the new school. We should note here that the board uh, has become a, a kind of uh, symbol, a political symbol for the Republican led General Assembly. And so when the faculty think about board intrusion onto university uh, curricular matters or even broader questions of governance, what we're really being told is Republicans keep your hands off UNC. Right, right. Because, yeah, most of the board, uh, all of the board of governors is appointed by the legislature and most of the board of trustees is appointed either by the legislature or by the board of governors. And so, yeah, you're right. It, it is seen as an extension of the legislature when when I think that that, that is not a fair assessment that I think the boards of trustees certainly have their own um, their own ideas that they're pursuing on campus. But um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. That that's the perception. And this is a story that has seen coverage not just in the state but nationally. Uh, of course, the uh, Wall Street Journal has, has a number of editorial pieces in the last weeks on the story. The Washington Post has covered it. We've seen other conservative outlets jump in, and I suspect if I read more progressive outlets, then we would find <laughs> coverage <laughs> there as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the the Wall Street Journal, as you said, they they broke the story, and they even pushed back against the faculty narrative, which was really um, really nice to see. Well, before we move on, I I kind of I guess I might rain on Jenna's parade a little, but I'm sorry, but that's what I do. Um, anyway, the both of these, and you did touch on it a little, but both of these issues kind of. You're looking at the hard governance versus soft or hard power versus soft power uh, dilemma. And that would be hard power is the official statement, the statement by uh, the Board of Governors, I believe, that um, you can't have political litmus tests. Um, that would be hard power. But soft power is what 
the faculty and staff are actually going to do. And um, we can see things like um, uh, UNC a few years ago adopted the Calvin principles for uh, institutional neutrality. But in that time period since then, we've seen them go all uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and um, adopt other workarounds uh, for to to get past that. Um, so <clears throat> we have to really keep an eye on that. And um, maybe there even has to be some sort of enforcement um, by the Board of Governors or the Board of Trustees to go around and make sure, hey, Yes, we passed a law, but they're still doing what all, they've always done. So we have to actually get tough. So, so that's that's an important consideration. And it may be that uh, something they want to do is maybe even conduct a study of hiring patterns before and afterwards to see whether there's any kind of change. So I, I just thought uh, we that that's that's something that has to be kept in mind going on from here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the new resolution does, does include enforcement provisions uh, for specific faculty who are in violation. So I think that that's, it, it's good that they're already thinking about implementation, you know, not just, not just a statement that this is not allowed, but this is the specific disciplinary procedure that you will face if you, if you do contravene the prohibition. And so I think that that, that shows that they, the, the, the problems that you're bringing up, Jay, I think they're very well aware. I, I also just wonder, sure. if, I wonder if this topic of uh, political litmus tests will just get more attention naturally because this involves very, like, it's a very personal, it affects people on a personal, personal level. If you're applying to, for a job at UNC and you're feeling compelled to, to speak out, I think this is a, an issue that is very easy to highlight and bring to the attention of the Board of Trustees, Board of Governors. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I think that people will will absolutely tell the Board of Governors what's going on if they are being asked for those statements. All right, then let's move on to Shannon. Uh, Shannon, what uh, caught your attention? Yeah, so uh, a few weeks ago, uh, John Seiler uh, with the National Association of Scholars wrote a piece uh, for us for the Martin Center's website um, entitled, When Discipline Specific Accreditors Go Woke. Um, and as we're well aware, I mean, the fact that we even need to have uh, uh, petitions against compelled speech uh, just points to the, to the very widespread problem of political litmus test, DEI dominating uh, universities uh, across the country. Uh, and, you know, there are many reasons why DEI has become so entrenched. And one of them, as John notes, um, uh, are these discipline-specific accreditors. These accreditors are different from uh, accreditor like SAC that, SACS that accredits the institution of UNC Chapel Hill, for example, as a whole. Um, the discipline specific accreditor, uh, there's one for the medical school, there's one for the journalism school, for social work, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, John did a really good job highlighting uh, what the specific accreditors are asking uh, uh, schools to do. So for example, uh, the LCME, which accredits medical schools, uh, they have in part as part of their criteria for accreditation, a diversity inclusion uh, standard. And if they deem that a university uh, falls short of it, then that can come with uh, some consequences, um, even the possibility of of losing accreditation. Um, I thought one interesting example was that Oregon Health and Science University, uh, they were found lacking in DEI related uh, goals. And the LCME said, um, well, we they issued a diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism strategic action plan. That's a mouthful. And you see these coming out from a lot of other accreditors. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill, for example, um, their J school, they, uh, their, their accreditation was downgraded to provisional 
because they were not, they failed to meet uh, the accreditor's uh, DEI standard. And now they have only two years to fix that. Um, and, you know, goodness knows they're working on it. Just a few months ago, uh, they released a similarly titled DEI action plan um, where they have all these metrics and goals to uh, instill DEI in their policies, um, possibly in the curricula. It's, it's somewhat unclear, um, but the influence is pervasive. And it's clear that the institutional incentives are strong for these schools to toe the DEI line. Uh, and they wield some power, maybe not as much power as maybe an institutional creditor like sex, but I took a look uh, at what would happen uh, for a medical school to lose uh, the medical school creditor. And apparently without, if you attend an institution, a medical school that does not have accreditation, your degree is basically worthless. Uh, it's good as it's, it's, you can't take national board exam, you you can't practice medicine. Um, so that that is a significant power that this accreditor has over medical schools. Now, the journalism school, uh, the I think it's the AECE JMC is the name of the accreditor. Uh, they do have some power. It, it is voluntary to to choose to be accredited. Um, if you're not accredited, uh, uh, I know a school doesn't have access to as much funds for scholarships, internships, and other, what do they call it, competitive prizes. And it's important to note that these uh, discipline-specific accreditors do have to, um, they have, they, they are federally, they have to, they have to be backed by federal standards in order to be an accreditor. Um, so there's definitely, it's not clear exactly what the uh, criteria are. Uh, to be allowed to have a creditorship, but we do know there's influence there. Um, and <laughs> so with with uh, Sachs and other ac regional creditors across the country, you know, we know with the Trump administration that schools have been free to be able to choose uh, what accreditors they have. And that has, you know, opened up a lot of opportunities to lessen the power of these of these um, institutions. What I am less clear on is what can be done about these discipline specific accreditors. Um, the answer is not very clear to me, and I I would invite discussion on that. Well, I mean, you and I have talked about the journalism accreditor, and my opinion is that universities should just tell them to take a hike. Uh, that one's voluntary and accreditation is expensive. Clearly it's an affront to academic freedom in many ways. And so I think even if there is some access to more funds, I think it's probably not worth it. And I think an institution that told the journalism accredit school accreditor that, you know, you are not wanted here. You're not helping. You're actually hindering us in teaching students how to be good journalists could make a name for themselves and really stand out as doing something different from what the whole politicized media is doing. It's a much harder question when you talk about the medical accreditors and the ones where they have, you know, the real power over over a person's career. And I think the answer to that is we need it we need alternative accreditors. We we can't rely on just one. I think um, the Trump administration and Betsy DeVos were on to something when they told schools that they didn't have to be accredited by the by the accreditor in their region and opened it up for competition. Obviously, we I, I like free markets. That's something the Martin Center has uh, talked about for a long time. It's competition. And I think that if we saw competition in the disciplinary accreditors, that would give us considerable improvement over where we are right now. Yeah, this is one of those situations where I think uh, the public conception of uh, what accreditation is all about is just far outpaced by what's actually happening on the ground. So I think that when, you know, when voters and, and policymakers think about what accreditation is, they have in mind these benevolent, politically neutral bodies that are just making sure that the professors actually went to, you know, went to graduate school somewhere and that the university is fulfilling its basic obligations to its students. 
Whereas what we're seeing in, in John's piece is uh, subject to creditors and discipline specific creditors that are getting into the nuts and bolts of the curriculum, which is appalling and, and totally uh, unjustified. I, I thought that John's uh, section on, on social work was maybe the most egregious. I'm reading from, from his piece here that social work programs are required by their accreditor to integrate anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion approaches across the curriculum. And furthermore, faculty and administrators must model anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice and respect for diversity and difference. The, the number of ideological presuppositions in those guidelines is just staggering. Uh, I'm reminded of a piece that we ran at the Martin Center uh, from the president of Cairn University, which was basically his his saga of just dumping his college's entire social work program rather than give in to the discipline a creditor uh, on, on some of these guidances. Well, I think something that uh, has to be raised is just how in for things like school of uh, journalism or a school of uh, or a social work program, just how important the reputational aspects are. If you're not accredited, that's a and choose not to be accredited, that's a signal to a lot to a huge number of potential employers. Um, you know, if you want if you want to go into mainstream journalism, you better and you go to a journalism school. You're not going to get uh, be first in line if you uh, went to a school that rejected accreditation um you know the washington post wants you certified as one of their people and um the same with like uh the state of uh or some uh some state bureaucracy that uh, oversees um social workers so i think that that is one of the major hurdles here like it's not quite so easy to, you know, although optimally, yeah, go take a hike is what I would like. But I think that a lot of schools are going to have a hard time doing that because their, you know, their reputation goes down, their rankings go down, the uh, other schools talk bad about them, which hurts their rankings. And so they're all worried about this reputation aspect. I don't know. I think you, you take a leaf out of Hillsdale's book. You say, we're not doing things the way the rest of you are doing things because the country as a whole knows that there are massive problems in higher ed. And I think if you, you know, if you market that correctly, that, you know, we're, we're not doing something, you know, we're not giving something up, up something valuable. We're doing something better that you can make a name for yourself that way. And yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to place your graduates at the Washington post, but that sounds like a good thing. That's okay. Well, there, there is, <laughs> yeah. I think there is room for a number of schools to do that. But um, as we've seen, like with uh, schools that reject federal, federal funding, there has not been this huge groundswell of this kind of activity. And I think, I think what's holding it back is the reputation aspect of like, the school's afraid that employers won't, the kids are afraid they won't get hired if they go to the school. The employers are afraid to hire kids who haven't been certified. And so there's kind of um, some, I think, uh, Graham, did you, I think even Graham meant, brought this up last time, um, that somebody has to make things happen um, before uh, people get wise to the fact that, no, you don't really need accreditation. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's somebody's got to go first. Okay. So for the record, next time I hire a journalist, we will not be looking for one who went to an accredited school. There, oh. I did it. The Martin Center okay. went first. Have we ever hired <laughs> somebody from a journalism school? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Interns, interns only. Okay, interns. I think we, we should... had a journalism uh, major here. We what should mention as well that uh, in, in the case of a lot of these uh, discipline specific accreditors, it isn't so much that they're forcing policies on deans and faculty as, as they are giving cover 
to deans and faculty who want to do these DEI initiatives anyway. And yes. so, you know, the, the the dean and faculty member, they, they say, well, here's what we want to do. And then they, you know, they tell the president, they tell the board of trustees, they tell the donors, they tell the parents, we have to do this. The the discipline specific accreditor is making us when in, in actuality, they, they want to do yes. it anyway. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that is why when Florida passed its new law telling schools that they had to switch institutional accreditors from time to time, you know, they did that specifically so that schools wouldn't get too cozy with their accreditors because, yeah, these relationships are not all, you know, enforcement from above. It's often that they're 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 working, you know, hand in glove to push the envelope on a on a shared vision of what higher ed should be doing. Like, I'm sure UNC School of Medicine uh, was thrilled to make political activism, uh, to integrate it into the curriculum. And oh, darn it, it looks like the accreditor is making us. Oh, dear. Yeah, I think there are definitely a lot of uh, true believers there at the medical school. For sure. Okay, and now we're going to move on to Graham. Uh, Graham, you've got something going here with uh, unionization. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, this is a feel-good story to to cap things off for the month. Uh, this was uh, reported at National Review and elsewhere a couple of weeks ago. Uh, undergraduate computer science teaching assistants at Brown University are attempting to unionize. Now, we, we frequently hear about graduate students unionizing. It's fairly rare when undergraduate groups try to do so. Uh, the, the facts on the ground are that this student uh, undergraduate teaching assistant organization asked Brown to voluntarily recognize their union. Uh, Brown declined to do so. Uh, and, and now it looks like the National Labor Relations Board is going to sort things out. A story that was making the rounds uh, a few days ago, uh, which is related, is that uh, Temple University, which is currently undertaking negotiations with its graduate uh, student union, Temple has decided to withhold tuition and healthcare benefits from its striking graduate student workers. And I think what we see in the in the pair of these stories, as well as pretty much all unionization on campus stories, is a, a real disconnect between the rhetoric that comes out of faculty and administration and the actual practice when things get tight, right? So we have on the one hand administrators who, you know, want, want to make leftist noises. Uh, and then we have students who are true believers. Uh, and uh, when, when those two groups collide over some kind of left-wing principle like unionization, what we see quickly is that administrators show their true colors. Uh, because as we as we know, as anyone knows who has worked with administrators in higher ed for any length of time, uh, higher ed administrators have exactly one political belief, and that is that there should be more higher ed administrators, <laughs> and that people who currently have those jobs should stay in them forever. So uh, quite a bit of hypocrisy here, and this is a situation where I think academic reformers can look at the scenario and, and maybe just cheer for casualties. <laughs> I looking at these moves for you know undergraduate ta unionization how many people are are we even talking about here is this is this much ado about nothing well if it is then uh it has made national news uh you know in, in error uh yeah it, it's a good question how many are there uh it's not clear that that doesn't seem to have been reported. Uh, you know, I, I have my own questions about who goes to Brown to study computer science, but uh, maybe we can discuss those next time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a bizarre story, though, in a lot of ways. But one has to wonder just, just how bad are the undergraduate TA working conditions at Brown that they feel like they have to unionize for, for better negotiating position. Well, I, I see that the socially responsible computing teaching assistants make fifteen dollars and fifty cents an hour, and head TAs make seventeen fifty an hour, which this this National Review article points out is more than double the federal minimum wage, and presumably, you know, they're not using this this TA hourly rate to actually put themselves through, through school. 
-hmm. we know that's impossible. Um, so it, it seems like, you know, the, maybe the working conditions are not as bad as they think they are. <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's part, it's has everything, almost everything to do with them for being taught that they're victims, that they're entitled to, you know, whatever, uh, privileges that they lack and, uh, to students expecting to live a certain quality of life. That is just ridiculous that college students in the past just didn't expect like you go live with five roommates. Like don't go out. Don't, you can't have your Starbucks latte every morning. Like budget. <laughs> like I think these are just basic concepts that young people and just don't have. And I mean, honestly, the Temple University article really hit home for me because I, you know, until recently, definitely been in the midst of grad school life. And I can't tell you how many grad students I knew or I was friends with who are single, uh, no children, et cetera, saying that they were not able to live on their, on their stipend. And I just thought that, well, I don't know what you're doing because- I mean, and especially like at the institution uh, where where we were at, there was tuition remission. That's the same case at Temple. And like these, these, in my view, these students are doing a steal. Like you're not having to pay any or most of your tuition and yet, and you're still getting a stipend on top of that. Like, that's amazing. And so this has been a personal, uh, I'm, I'm personal confusion I've had over the years. What do they expect? Yeah, the, the sense of grievance among the Temple graduate students, like how dare you take away all of our pay and benefits just because we stopped working. <laughs> we, we refuse to work, but we don't want there to be any consequences for that. I mean, it, it, it's really a, it's a parable about the entitlement of the American higher ed consumer as much as anything. Yeah. yeah. I also like, I think there are probably several thousand adjuncts out there, recent, min, recently minted PhDs who would gladly come in and do those jobs that, that the temple TAs don't want to do. So yeah, it is a, the, the hubris mm -hmm. is well, I will, pretty considerable. Uh, yeah. I, uh, picking up on that, the, this, this, um, there is, a question of the supply and demand for new professors. Um, how many graduate students do we need to get through PhD programs uh, today? And so why are we having them teaching when we've got a huge labor pool out there of um, young, recently uh, minted PhDs who would love a full-time job? So that kind of raises a question of... Uh, Maybe we have to shift the teaching, uh, who does the teaching, a little bit. But there's also some other um, fundamental questions I think this issue raises, and it's like there's a basic question of the relation of the school to students. Um, are these, are they to grad students or even TAs? Are they students? Are they employees? Are they independent scholars? And... Um, you know, so uh, that's something that it's starting, the cracks are starting to show in what has traditionally been. We're now starting to see athletes get uh, pay for their, what is it, uh, Shannon? What was it? Lightness, but they don't yeah. get the pay from the universities. Okay, they, well, they get paid from the NCAA, I guess. Um, no, they, but, get, they get paid for, from advertisers. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's still kind of like a fundamental shift in how they're they're viewed, and um, there's even a bigger. It's like um, there's kind of a fundamental challenge to governance and authority here. You see, in the whole left wing world, um, you know, the uh, there's this idea of reorganizing private business to like stakeholders away from shareholders. In other words. Um, you know, the customers or whoever, or just some unnamed group somehow has control of what gets done in a private business rather than the shareholders who are just interested in profit. And th this is kind of the same dynamic going on here. The 
student, uh, the grad students who want to unionize and the other students who want to unionize, they're kind of being traded like stakeholders and they're take, trying to take power from the boards who, um, so there's, there's a lot going on under the surface here, I think. Could add though, Jay, that your uh, your uh, your parallel about the student athletes and name, image, and likeness rights. I mean, at least student athletes are creating value. I've never heard of a graduate student doing that. And I, I say this as a former graduate student myself. So. Oh, they're teaching classes. I mean, that, that's true. That's true. Creating a lot of papers. Yeah. So, so what they're doing is they're cost control. So maybe yes. not adding value to the education, but they're producing cost control for the uh, universities. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please like, follow, share, subscribe, or even say something nice about us in the comments. And if you want to see the full range of Martin Center content, please visit our website at www.jamesgmartin.center.